You wouldn't be able to watch this without tonight's invention. But it isn't the television. Modern aeroplanes wouldn't be able to fly without it. But it isn't the jet engine. It's given us mobile phones, compact discs and space travel. Without it, money would effectively cease to exist. Western society would collapse. And worst of all, I wouldn't be able to start my car. So, on balance then, a tentative thumbs up for the computer. Just about every area of our lives today has been touched by the silicon hand of the microprocessor. Computers keep us warm, they cook our food, they play our music, they protect us from harm. In so many ways, they're a better, faster us. On the other hand, though, computers are slow, petulant, bad-tempered, they live in a permanent state of PMT, and they have no sense of ambiguity. And mine, mine is now just taken to just turning itself off. You're just typing away, it's gone. And then when you turn it back on again, it says on the screen, you didn't shut me down properly, now I'm going to have to check all the discs. And I didn't turn you off! I hate them! I hate them so much! I love them! Nothing, nothing in the world causes me more stress than computers! I love them, every molecule of their construction! You, this is perfect! I can't stand you! To make matters worse, computers have become so much more than glorified typewriters. They're robots, cars, designers and pilots. Apparently, computers now have intelligence. They've become so bright, they can even chop vegetables. Computers, then, have certainly changed the world. Even my willfully low-tech life as a journalist has been completely transformed by computers. You wouldn't believe how backward things were for a reporter way back in the late 20th century. When I was a lad, it wasn't just the hairstyles that were different. To get copy to press, you had to dictate your article to a copy typist who sent it to a sub-editor who checked and edited it with his blue pencil before handing it on to the pictures editor who, after doing picture editing things, passed it on to a layout editor who decided on a page for the article. Next, off it went to the printers. First, the page was made up in a flatbed and proofs taken, then a mould was made, which was turned by the mysteries of hot metal into a print roller. Finally, the press was rolled. At last. Today, however, Things are a bit different. I've just written a newspaper column on this laptop while flying across the Pacific Ocean. And now I'm going to email it via satellite to London for tomorrow... No, not tomorrow. For yesterday's paper. It is, it's yesterday's. That makes your head hurt. Anyway, it's gone. Bye. Today, all those copy typists, editors, printers and so on are replaced by Jerry and his computer. Jerry subs, Jerry lays out and Jerry sends the page to press. Jerry does everything in a fraction of the time. So, thanks to the computer, a man in Penzance can now read something that I wrote the day before, 35,000 feet above New Zealand. And do you know what the most amazing thing about that is? That we take it for granted. Today, computers come in many different forms, but whatever they appear to be doing, all they're actually doing is maths, very quickly. The story of the quest to build an electronic brain, how computers were conceived, how they grew up and where they're taking us to now, is an epic spanning three centuries. It's a story of sex and suicide, a tale of obsession and excess. And, as with so much of what we now call civilization, it all started with the Victorians. The Victorians enjoyed life at the very pinnacle of the British Empire. 
But the Industrial Revolution, the machine age, relied on men called computers, men who did maths with a pencil. Trouble was, these men with pencils made mistakes. What was needed was to get rid of human error. The computers, the men with pencils, needed to be replaced with something more reliable. What was needed was a mechanical brain. But to come up with the goods, it took a man with a pencil. Charles Babbage was the son of a wealthy banker. He was Lucian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University. He was a fellow of the Royal Society, a respected economist and amateur playwright, the archetypal polymath, known to everybody who mattered in Victorian London. But it all went wrong. When he died 130 years ago, he was uncelebrated and unloved. No one came to his funeral. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother here departed, we therefore commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes. In life, Babbage was a man who mingled with the glitterati of the Victorian sure, intelligentsia. In death, he was abandoned by all but his closest relatives, a far cry from his remarkable and full career. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He immersed himself in the study of biblical miracles and spent months calculating that the chances of being raised from the dead were one in ten to the power of twelve. Weird. But then this was a man who once baked himself in an oven at 265 degrees Fahrenheit for exactly four minutes to find out what would happen. Then, when he'd cooled down, he invented the Greenwich time signal. One afternoon, for fun, he went to the London borough of Marylebone and counted all the broken window panes. There were 462. And then he drew up a chart detailing the precise cause and type of every single break. What well, about this one? One day he was lowered into Mount Vesuvius because he wanted to know how hot lava was. Babbage was a complete number junkie. He was obsessed with order, he was obsessed with math, he was obsessed with tabulation. Every part of his life had to be put in a neat, ordered, structured chart. What Babbage needed was a machine. And the machine he eventually built to fuel his thirst for order was what he called his difference engine. It was what we today might call a computer. It was what his Victorian audience called a miracle. It's to build another iron ship. Even like Babbage publicised his invention at the soirees he held for the great and the good of Victorian London. Everyone from Darwin to Brunel to Charles Dickens and Mary Shelley were guests at Mr Babbage's dinner table. Drown would be the very last thing I'd grab. <laughs> These were the Victorian opinion formers, men of science and politics, the people who mattered. One will simply embark at Southampton at one end and then walk to America at the other. <laughs> and while the diners were dazzled by the wit and erudition to be had, the real reason they were there was for the hard sell. Ladies and gentlemen, if you please. Babbage had only built a demonstration piece, a working model of the difference engine. If he was to complete the project, he needed backers. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a machine that can perform miracles. Observe, if you will, the machine displays number two. When I crank the handle, lo and behold, number four. Bravo. And another turn? Six. Indeed, my dear, number six. And what would happen At the time, the idea that a machine more. could be instructed Eight. was a radical concept. It seemed to Babbage's Victorian audience that what they were watching was a machine almost capable of thought. Another turn. Babbage was so far